we are recording um, with Mike Helenig, filmmaker, cinematographer of I Am Not a Robot, and writer, director, producer, and editor of a passion piece you made, um, Centro Medico Umberto Para. Thanks for being on the show, Mike. Thanks, Kostya. Nice to nice to be here. Um, thanks, man. We're uh, honored to have you on the show. And, you know, the two pieces that you shared with me, the Central Medico is a younger piece as a younger filmmaker, and it definitely shows the heart of the person. And it is uh, a link that we'll share, and people can go check out. It's a really cool documentary about medical services being um, put into place by volunteer doctors, American doctors. In, is it Guatemala? Oh, Bolivia. Bolivia. Sorry. Yeah. Bolivia. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really heartfelt piece. We're going to talk about I Am Not a Robot. And that piece is a more recent work that you've done as a cinematographer. We can also share that link with the audience. So in terms of I Am Not a Robot, your role as a cinematographer, before I ask you the very first question, which is your emotional connection to that piece, and I know there, I'm saying there might be like, like just a kind of uh, chain of events that got you into it. Um, but, you know, what I found was it was a really well shot, well done documentary, highly professional. The lighting is great. Um, which I mentioned to you, you know, before as we were talking, like how important that is for a cinematographer to have that love of lighting. I mean, it's all about the light, you know, the framing, whatever. It's great. You know, lights, you don't have that. You don't have the heart. And um, so in terms of kicking us off, just, in ter- you know, topically, what I found really interesting about I Am Not a Robot is like, here it is, the the plot line you know robot is uh masquerading pretending um to be human in order to get a job and and there's already this rivalry and it's a comedic thing and you know there's this rivalry as is very um almost stereotypical common in terms of the future robot versus man robot versus man right and i'm like after watching the movie which I enjoyed to, you know, very nice in and out short film. Um, it's unique. And that is comedic take with this job kind of interview thing, um, almost like a commercial for recapture. Um, I, I'm asking myself, well, why is it that there's such a, you know, it is so commonly perceived by humans, people that there's going to be this war between man and machine. And, you know, that's what it posited to me. And for me, this was my answer, you know, is that I think man is inherently afraid of his intellect and feels like he cannot control his intellect. Like his intellect will run away from his control. And ultimately, the imagination is limited by the intellect. And and the reason I came up with that is because it's constantly positing man versus robot, man versus robot. Like there's no other way if the mind is thinking, well, what's going to happen to these AI technologies? And right now this is so thematic. So thank you for being so gracious and me speaking so much, which I don't like to do in these interviews, but that kind of laid out as a platform, you know, uh, uh, to jump from. What is your emotional, intellectual, um, imaginative connection to this piece? Like you said, it's very topical at the moment. Um, you know, right now we're humans are scared that AI is going to take all their jobs. Um, you know, we have we have some screenwriters <laughs> worried that AI is going to write scripts. We have people that work in factories worried that AI is going to replace them. We have editors worried that, you know, AI is going to start editing movies. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe AI will take cinematographers jobs eventually. I hope that's not the case, but you know, so it's interesting with this piece because you have this, this robot coming in that looks like a perfect human applying for a job and, uh, and eventually the real human, you know, cracks him and figures out that he is a robot. Um, you know, personal connection i guess i guess the personal connection is that it's just something that's a very current topic so the guy who wrote it brian was maybe 
a few year, um, a year or two ahead ahead of himself because we made this at the start of the pandemic. So, uh huh. Um, okay. And what do you think as a viewer the message of the movie is? Message of the movie for the viewer. Yeah. Um, I guess the ultimate message of um, the message of the movie is maybe that AI is coming for us, but also the message is that humans still have one leg up on the robots. Cause in the, in the short film, um, you know, the robot can't, there's, there's one task that the robot can't do. And so the human, you know, figures out that he's actually, actually, actually a robot. So, um, Maybe the moral of the story is the robots aren't there yet. <laughs> I guess. Well, that's, you know, that's, uh, I think, very topical. One of the things that I've had to do in my uh, trajectory of launching Digipops TV is go from filmmaker to software engineer. And okay. Software developer, you know, I use AI daily. You know, chat GPT is on my radar every day. And what it helps me do is iterate or develop faster, but you still have to tell it what you want it to do. Right. So I think in terms of these job roles and these fears, you know, these mindsets that people have, something has to program the thing to do the thing. And um, something's got to know what, it ultimately wants and the thing doesn't know you know you we think well oh well let me program it it's gonna we're gonna program it to survive at all costs okay well there are so many other factors that go into survival that um may dictate what the thing needs to do at any given point and those nuances and having that understanding I think is still well, well beyond what chat GPT can do. Um, however, that said, um, what are your thoughts about that? Um, what are my thoughts about, do I think, you know, eventually robots will, will be able to think for themselves? Yeah. yeah. And replace you. I don't really, I'm not, I'm not fearful of that, at least not in my lifetime, uh, the next 40 or 50 years. I think that fear somewhat, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think many people have a fear that robots are going to replace humans. You know what else I got out of this movie? I got out of this movie, this creator versus creation thing, right? And this thing ultimately of parent versus child thing. And the child gets, is replacing the parent. The son takes the role of the father, right? And there's some rivalry there because we as humans are afraid to face death. And in this movie, ultimately, that's what's happening, right? Is that this creation is threatening our lives and our job, our security, our ability to survive and take care of ourselves and what i'm saying is is that are we limited in our thinking no we're not limited in our thinking at all i mean the human mind i saw i saw something in science magazine the other day or i was talking to a neurologist we only use like 10 percent of our brain so we're not we may be our thinking may be small, but the capacity of our brain is actually enormous. I mean, we have we have like millions and millions and millions of neurons in our brain, and we only use ten percent of them. Um, I think a lot of what you're talking about maybe is unfounded fear. I don't actually think that. I think the human human mind is actually pretty phenomenal, and people can make new neural connections constantly. Obviously, computers, you know, can you know you can keep adding drives and keep adding computing power, but. You also have people that continue to study things and go on to get PhDs in five, you know, five, 10 areas. That's not most humans, but there are some humans that choose to use more of their mental capacity than others. So it is possible to go beyond the limits of our thinking as seeing these computers, these machines as adversarial. And perhaps one day our thinking can evolve to 
there's going to be some uh, utopian society where man and machine can serve one another in a way coexist that's yeah exactly i mean you make me think of uh of ai i mean steven spielberg's movie with heli joel osmond when he was a little boy um and at the end of the film you know like heli joel osmond gets i don't know if you remember but he gets frozen and then he's like at the bottom of the ocean and eventually he gets discovered like thousand years later by the human AI robots that have evolved from us and they, they unfreeze him. And so now he's a human living with a bunch of robots, like a thousand years in the future. Um, so there's, mm. they are coexisting in mm. Steven Spielberg's mind in that movie. Huh. Uh, and, and what was the dynamic that allowed them to coexist? How did it was, he integrate into the robot society as a man? I mean, that's the, that's the very end of the film. So wow. you don't really, if I recall correctly, you don't really remember what happens, but he gets frozen kind of like, what's it called? Um, cryogenic. Cryogenics. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that what's, that's what they do in the movie, but it's the same idea. Yeah. And I mean, he just gets frozen because he's at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and then he wakes up like a thousand years later after we've destroyed the earth supposedly because of like carbon emissions and global warming and the robots now exist on the earth. And so now he's the lone human living with the robots. Huh. Kind of a little bit of a wandering answer, but it's related. I got to check it out. I haven't seen that. Um, I mean, it's like 19, 2005, something like that. Okay. All right. That's probably when I stopped watching movies. Um, <laughs> so let me ask you this. Um, and, you know, the we may kind of switch gears and focus on Centro Medica, Alberto, um, Parra here, uh, because it might be a more you know, relevant topical answer. But, um, you know, feel free to focus on whichever film is true. You know, since making one of these movies, right, whichever one, and I would think the one, you know, that you put everything into in terms of doing it all yourself as a one man band. How have you been changed as a person? How did that change me as a person making yeah. that more? I, did I guess, I guess that's the question. Which one do you feel changed you more as a person? Oh yeah. I mean, hands down. Sure. I, I don't want to cut you off. No, no, no. You're, you're right. Hands down, if I had to pick a film that changed me more as a person, it would be the Centro Medico Umberto Parra. I mean, that was, um, I mean, I Am Not a Robot it was a great, fun, short film um, that prompts sort of like these AI human questions. But obviously, that's very philosophical and very abstract. Centro Medico Umberto Parra was something I did. I filmed it when I was 25 years old. Um, and up until that point, I had never left the United States. You know, I'd lived in. New York, New Jersey, California, Arizona. Um, and I had a friend that I went to college with. Both his parents were doctors, um, like a kidney specialist and a something else specialist. Um, and they somehow were acquainted with a doctor in Bolivia, in Santa, Santa Cruz, Bolivia. Um, and the American doctors and this Bolivian doctor, um, I should name them, Mark Mollich, Susan Ho, and uh, Douglas VROL, they started a clinic in this rainforest, in a rainforest. I mean, there's parts of Bolivia that are rainforest. Um, it was like two hours outside of Santa Cruz, a very small village called Palacio. Um, and uh, they started a medical clinic down there. Um, and the people who live down there, um, just to put things in perspective, um, the richest man in in the town of Palacio owned a horse, um, the richest man. Nobody owned cars. Uh, everybody else got around on foot. Um, there was no medical care within miles. Um, if they needed to get medical care, they needed to get to Santa Cruz, Bolivia, which was the closest city, which was two hours away, you know, but there's like no buses or trains or anything like that. They would have to, so, you know, these people had, extremely low to no income um and most of them hadn't seen doctors like 
ever or like within years. So things that we completely take for granted, like getting our teeth cleaned or getting a vaccination or, you know, uh, I have an ear infection, you know, I need some drops. All of that stuff was totally foreign to them. Um, and um, I mean, I, I, I say this respectfully. I mean, I asked this woman's permission through one of the doctors. So, but I mean, like a woman came in to, um, so these doctors started this clinic. I mean, they funded it, they funded it, they built no, it. No, I'm shaking my head because it was horrific. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I was just, I was, yeah. uh, I was backtracking. Okay. So All right. built, built this, um, and they literally built it like in the middle of the rainforest where there's no other buildings. Yeah. Um, and all the people lived in houses made out of mud and sticks. Um, um, so they built this clinic. They had some bunk beds in there for the medical student volunteers that would go down and people like myself that went down to volunteer. Um, they had like a couple exam rooms, uh, like a couple closets for medicine, like a pharmacy. Um, and like one dental suite with like some limited dental equipment. And just to give you an idea of like what some, some people would come in and like, they were just getting their teeth pulled. But this one woman came in um, and I was filming and, you know, she said, she said, doctors, I have something on my chest. Um, and she took off her shirt and her like, her like entire left or right. I don't recall. Uh, breast was, um, I don't know the medical term. It was lacerated. It was, an it was almost wound. like it was like it was like like eaten away, um, yeah. and it was very um, it's ex it's extremely disturbing. Um, if you watch the piece, you'll see uh, oh, there's yeah. some there's some blurring going on in that just to protect her identity. Um, but something like that that obviously a woman in the United States at the first sign of any problem would immediately be in the emergency room. This woman waited months or a year um, to get treatment and. Anyway, it's all very it's scary. Horrific. I mean, it could have yeah, been like horrific. a little thing in Neosporin could have, you know, uh, prevented that. And in over a year or uh, many, many months, you know, it grew into that. And she said she cried every night. Oh, um, yeah. When you saw in the subtitles uh, during watching the film. Yeah. 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 And the doctors I mean, say it was, I, I believe, I mean, if I recall, they thought it was breast cancer. Um Anyway, just basically things that we address like immediately or within yeah. a week or two yeah. weeks or a month yeah. or addressing within two or three years. And um, so it's kind of a very scary situation. Um, but the way it changed me was when I came back to the United States and, you know, my parents picked me up at the airport and we like drove into New York City is, you know, you go from like this. I don't like the term, but quote, third world country in Bolivia. And then you go into New York City and, you know, you walk down Broadway and, you know, there's people wearing $500 suits and gold rings and whatever. Yeah, normal that's a cheap letters. suit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, it kind of just makes you realize how truly lucky we are. As many problems as our country has, it makes you realize how truly lucky we are and how fortunate we are to live in the United States and to have our first world problems like, you know, Oh, I didn't get the job I want or, Oh, my girlfriend broke up with me or like whatever, but our problems are like nothing compared to some of these problems, these medical problems that people have in other parts of the world. Um, and that, I mean, that's how it changed me. And the positive thing is that these three doctors, one of them has since passed away. May, she was an amazing woman. Uh, and it was her idea to start this clinic, Dr. Susan Ho. Um, and then her husband, Mark Malich, who is retired, and then Dr. Douglas Viro, Villaroel, who lives in Bolivia, they all started this clinic. Um, and, and they provide medical care with the help of many other people um, to all these folks in Bolivia. Um, and it, it's truly amazing. So, I mean, the message of the piece is, is just one of, one of hope. Um, and it's also a message of just helping your fellow uh, human, um, and realizing that there are people in the world that, you know, need, um, that are less fortunate. And, um, Mark Malich, the, the, one of the doctors says, 
I don't remember exactly what he says in the piece, but something to the effect of maybe maybe it's our job or maybe we're supposed to help. Right. Some something about when when you are more fortunate, it, you ought to help others who are less fortunate. Um, and that's at the very end of the piece. And um, as you can yeah. see, you know, it's it's emotional piece to make. Um, and um, it's a good thing there's people in the world like them that try to make a difference. It's awesome, Mike, and it's still going on. Yeah, today. sorry, I'm getting off. <laughs> no, it's great, man. I mean, I really appreciate it. This is really the nature of the show, you know, and it's, um, you know, about how we can make a difference through art, you know, and um, I think that's what this um, piece illustrated is how people can make a difference with whatever skill sets they have. You know, you can make a difference with anything, you know, whatever you're doing any day, you know, and selling bubble gum at the little convenience store. I mean, you greet a person with a smile, you change them from picking up the gun at night. You know, it's yeah. huge. Yeah. So how do we connect and interact with people? And it's interesting, you know, when we talk about that and, and look at both of these two pieces side by side, that seems so desperate. Um, but there's a relation, right? This, this connection with AI that you just like, you, you can't make, you know, there's just a block. You, you can go so far. Oh, it can make you laugh, but it, you know, there's a limit there. And then there's this connection with other humans that's limitless and that can get us into this infinite space of our humanity. And what may else is there? Well, may, well may, I don't know. I was kind of struggling with some of your questions about the first piece because, totally. <laughs> you know, because I, <laughs> I, <laughs> Well, no, I don't. That's not a criticism of myself. I mean, I, you're okay, cool. Um, just because, you know, I gravitate to the movies because they're fun and interesting. And that was more of my draw to I am not a robot. But the the documentary piece is more personal. But maybe that kind of comes full circle to answer your initial series of questions. And it's that. I don't know if we can if we'll be taken over by robots or, or not in a hundred or five yeah. <laughs> years. You know, I won't be here, but we can only really connect with each other as humans. Humans can't really connect with technology, at least now. And when we try with things like social media, um, they're not real connections. I mean, not to get dark, but like you we talk about. You talk, you talk about children, you know, who when you and me were kids, I'm a plus or minus a similar age, you know, we'd go outside and play baseball or play, you know, hide and seek or whatever we did, go over to our friend's house and have a birthday party. And now the social connections on social media, while they have some value, it, it's not the same. And you can see it with the decline in children's mental health, which is like a massive topic nowadays. Is that what's happening? No shit. Um, I mean- there's a lot of concern for parents because kids are trying to get their personal fixes through their iPhones, which it's not really the same. Yeah. Um, and yeah. That, I mean, that's kind of oh, yeah. goes into the AI question. Oh, for sure. Me and my wife are deathly afraid of like technology and what we're seeing in the world with our four year old. And it's like, you know, we're out of here. We're like going to Waldorf school in Massachusetts. And yeah. There. It's yeah. Like media yeah. free, you know? So, um, you know, my feeling is that there's always something deep behind anything a human does, right? There's whatever you, if you're committing yourself to, you know, this film, I am a robot, you're there, you got to work with this guy, this guy, that guy. Yes, you're advancing your career, but there's, there's something that is you're putting into it and you're part of this bigger dynamic and this meta system and their meta system and systems. And if you dig deep enough, right, through all that, you get to, I think, where we've gotten to in our conversation is realizing, oh, okay, well, there's this thing. And now we can also talk about careers, right? You know, as filmmakers, like, what does a filmmaker want to do? Well, I'm a filmmaker and I need to get a job as a filmmaker. Uh, guess what? It's not going to happen. I hate to tell you. I mean, I'm sorry to piss people off and bum people out if that's what it, that says. But I want to put it in that way because, yeah, I'm a believer. Like, yeah, follow your dreams. I've been doing this for like 10, 15 years. I, it's going to happen eventually. But it's I don't longer care if it happens or not. I'm doing it because I feel the moment is urging me on to do it. And I think there is it is my work for right now. And. I no longer am driven by a making money or career or legitimizing myself as an artist through making money in a career. And that's the point. That's why I'm saying, Hey, 
you're not going to get that job because I've looked into the numbers. There are millions of people who want to be a filmmaker. There are tens, hundreds of thousands that have the talent to be a filmmaker because I've interviewed them. And there is one position. I'm over. It's pretty close to that. It's point like zero zero one percent of like um, films, short films. It's like it's either point one percent or point zero zero one percent of films submitted to any of the, like Sundance top tier film festival. Short films get in. Sure. Okay. So there's just it's a numbers game, man. That's why your parents tell you to be a doctor. Because right. there's a huge demand for healthcare. It's one of the largest industries in the world, right? Billion, 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 billion. So it's just, there is that dynamic. And yet, if you want to be an artist, be an artist, but do it for the right reason. And don't try to legitimize yourself as a artist and, you know, and think you need a million, 10,000, whatever it is to make your movie. You don't need money to make a movie. Go make a movie, right? Um so here we are in, in this dichotomy between the two films that you've created, and we're finding something that relates to our world and universe. And so I'll shut up because I think I've come to the end of my rant. What, where, you, where does that hit in terms of you know what I've said with you? What are your thoughts and feelings around all that? Oh, I, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I guess I've gotten to the point in my own career where I used to feel like I had to climb some sort of ladder. Like I had to do this. I had to be a DP on, on a feature. I had to be a DP on a TV show. I had to, you know, um, and there was a lot of like status and like higher, you know, I have to climb this ladder. Um, that thing that, you know, I'm not, I'm not at the top of my game or at the top of the film industry. I don't have an Oscar. I'm not, you know, James Cameron or Steven Spielberg, but at the same time, I feel like I've been in the industry long enough to recognize what I'm about to say, if you're just doing something for status or because you want to work with so-and-so, I want to work with, I want to work with Tom Hanks. I want to work with Tom Cruise. Um, that's fine. But like, like you said, there's like thousands of other people that think that same way. Um, and that's not really going to make you happy, nor is it going to make you a better filmmaker. Um, so I'm agreeing with what you said. You should, you should not work on stuff because other people think it's cool. You should work on stuff because you think it's cool and because you're passionate about it. Um, and if that's a commercial, cause you think it's really funny and you love the colors, well, that's, that's fine. And if it's a documentary about a medical clinic, well, that's fine. Um, but I, it's, it's like completely cliche to say, but I think it's good advice. You have to be true to yourself. And like some people will be like, Oh, you're just working on corporate videos. Well, if that makes you happy, then you should do it. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, sure. and you'll, I guess the, the, you'll succeed if it makes you happy because the work won't be work. Right. You'll just be like, I want to do this. Yeah. You'll get up and be like, I want to work on the shot list. I want to work on the lighting diagram. I want to work on the casting. You know, yeah. if you're doing it for status, you'll be like, what do I have to do to accomplish X? Right. You're never and satisfied. Yeah, you can't. More is not something that's achievable. Like, because right. once you get more, well, then you want more. You'll you'll never right. be happy. Um, and there yeah. was something else you said that really struck with me, which was if you really get off on technical and camera and uh, creative lighting, like I do, then maybe this isn't as applicable. But if you're the type of person that's a writer, like like yourself, um, or even someone who's not a writer but comes up with the original ideas. I think you need to focus on what are you passionate about creating? I saw an interview with Martin Scorsese, um, who's what he makes is not what I would, I would never make a mob movie. I'm a bit too sentimental for that <laughs> and not violent enough. But yeah. he said in an interview, I wanted to tell stories about this group of people, about this subculture of the Italian mob. And that was his primary motivation. Not that he wanted to be behind a camera, you know, and get his photo taken like this or be famous. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of successful yeah. people. Yeah. I think that's super important to mention. And I, I think it's, it's super important to say that what is the driving thrust and, and how you ultimately have to live with yourself in terms of what it is you do and not the external accolades. And it's so difficult, you know, it's not to, 
to take away from the challenge of being an artist or being a filmmaker in terms of if you love it and you want to practice your craft, whether it's writing and directing, the opportunities for doing commercial work far outweigh the creative work. And oftentimes you have to, or you, you, you will, um, try to do both, right? You'll try to have your day job doing whatever you can related to your craft and then practice the love that you have um, for it on the side. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that do that. Yeah, for sure. I totally agree. Yeah. And so, you know, I just, you know, I didn't want to come off or have, you know, viewers think that, you know, we're both not aware of the challenges and the financial challenges that people face in terms of trying to realize their craft. And again, going back to the Centro Umberto film and and the, you know, third world, first world problems, it's so complex in terms of, you know, what our feelings are of being self-actualized. And in a, a place like um, Bolivia that, in a remote place in Bolivia that doesn't have the resources, you know, the harmony a human being feels, I think, is defined very differently than how we may define it in our culture. Um, and, you know, the career idea and aspirations may be very different. Um, how do you see that comparison? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um I think in the United States, I feel like this has changed from, I mean, I'm 43, but I feel like this has changed from when I was a kid and like when my parents were kids till now, but I feel like we've become a very hyper career oriented society, hyper individualistic society, at least in certain places like LA mm -hmm. that's having to do mm -hmm. with the movies and New York mm -hmm. having to do possibly with the financial industry. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, a lot of individualism. There's a lot of status. There's a lot of stuff like that in Bolivia. I got a sense in the small town that the small village that I was in Palacio, there's more of a value on community and family and the small things in life. Like you'll see on little pillows or little posters when you walk into someone's bathroom, right. it's, the, it's right. the little things right. in life that right. make it worthwhile. Right. Right. You know, uh, you know, a neighbor helping a neighbor, you know, uh, walking down the street, you know, or in this case, the village down the dirt path. And like all these people know your name and say, hey, how you doing? Whereas that type of thing doesn't really happen in New York City or in Hollywood that much. Uh, you know, you you would go to your friend's houses, but there's not like a, the city is too large to have, have a small community yeah. in some ways. Um, obviously, there's sub communities, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's such an important thing that you mentioned because, you know, in my um, day to day, I, I, I practice a lot of um, yoga and, you know, the yoga means union and um, yoga means union, union okay. translation. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, and so it's so interesting, you know, the union humans feel in community, the struggle with community because of the hyper um, competitiveness, especially yeah. in cities like New York and um, LA. How do we solve our first world problem? Because that's a big one. You know, that is a big, big, you know, let's just use cancer. I mean, it's, it's eating lives, right? It's, it's hurting people mentally, huge mental health, you know, do you have any ideas of how we can approach that as individuals? The film and television industry, I guess I should just say the media industry, has like enormous power. I mean, possibly just as much power as like as the government um, in terms of cultural influence. And if you look at the types of films that were made like when I was a kid, like in the 80s and 90s, and you look at the types of films that we're making today, um, the amount of the values of those films has completely changed. Is that right? I wouldn't I, know. That's my, I mean, that's my opinion. I, um, you're probably right. I haven't been watching movies for a while. 
Okay. I, yeah. I mean, I guess it's just like a general sense, like, you know, um, I feel like in the eighties and, and the nineties, the films were more films about family, you know, more films about community, community and helping others. It's not, it's not to say that there wasn't like a mob movie made back then there was, but like nowadays you go on Netflix and I might get in trouble with some of my industry colleagues for saying this, but like, like 60% of the movie covers have a guy like robbing a bank or holding like a automatic weapon on the cover, you know, I, you know, oh, and, and then people kind of, and all these films are marketed to like 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds. And then we, we kind of wonder like, well, why is the world falling apart? Well, why are we marketing films to 18, 19 and 21 year olds with like AR 15s on the cover? I mean, come on guys. I mean, Hollywood's a profit profit driven industry, but um, and industries can't have an industry can't have a conscience, but the individuals that make up the industry can have a conscience, yes. and and uh, and the people that own these studios and these directors and producers, it's kind of hard for crew people because they would have to decline the jobs. But the people that are getting the screenplays and choosing to make these movies, they could do a far better job of this, and and they know it. But there, a lot of these studios are choosing to make millions over to make something that would actually value American society and maybe help American society. Michael Hellenick, filmmaker, Heart of Gold. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's a pleasure and an honor to meet you. Thank you, Kostya. Thank you for uh, listening to my long-winded answers. Oh my God, please. Thank you for opening up. It's it's really an honor. Michael, until um, next time, everybody play it forward. Peace out. All right. Thanks for having me.